Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, Managing Editor for Shadowproof.com, and welcome to the Dissenter Weekly for March 4th, 2021. Before we get rolling on our whistleblower stories for the week, Brian has a few things for you. Hey there, Kevin, and hello to everybody watching. Just the same thing that I say every week, just reminding you, uh, you could probably say this along with me in the audience at this point, just reminding you to uh, follow us wherever you're watching, uh, subscribe on YouTube, like us on Facebook and Twitter um, to keep up to date with our reporting and with these streams that we do every Thursday. And if you like our work and you want to support it, um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can give right there or you can head on over to shadowproof.com slash donate. Uh, and check out some of our options there for donations and membership. Um, Let's dive right in, Kevin. First story we have here for this week, uh, there's a report that whistleblower laws are underutilized throughout the world. Uh, We were talking about this just before we jumped on. Can you tell uh, folks about this? Yeah, so this is a report that was put together by the Government Accountability Project. They do some of the most foremost work on whistleblower advocacy and uh, fighting for stronger laws. Uh, They collaborated with the International Bar Association's Legal Policy and Research Unit. They examined laws in 37 countries. They looked at the successes and the shortcomings, they say, of these protections, uh, the laws that have been adopted in the last decades in these countries. And then they uh, put out uh, their, their own uh, analysis of how these whistleblower protections are faring in those countries. Like, as in, are these whistleblower laws working? In fact, that's the name of the report. Are the whistleblower laws working? And so uh, the thing that they point out is that these laws do not operate in a vacuum, as it says in the report setting high protection standards and laying down strong rights in the law is not the end of the story. Um, It's only the first step. Even the most sophisticated protection regime, regime, according to the report, uh, can only be fully effective if the judicial and enforcement ecosystem in which this regime is integrated supports such effectiveness. So for example, uh, the United States is 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 a really good country to examine because according to the way that they looked at the laws, the US has many whistleblower protection laws on the books and uh, legislators have adopted what they call raw best practices or they've agreed that these whistleblower protections should be available to government employees um, and, and to people who may wanna claim whistleblower protections who you know may not be in the government. But US rights, fall, they fail such fundamental criteria as court access for government whistleblowers, as well as protections for those outside the workplace and against non-workplace retaliation, like civil and criminal liability. So yes, there is a very limited range of protections available, even though um, there are these laws that are available for government whistleblowers, and it can often be really difficult to get whistleblower protection to blow the whistle against corporations. Um, if you're if you're a worker, um, you, you, it can be difficult to have protection as well. So if I understand it, what they're pointing out is that even with whistleblower protections on the books, it does not necessarily mean that those are going to protect you. So that's what makes this kind of a report really important because it gets down into the very minute and finer details of whistleblower law and and really finds the devil in the details about whether these laws are actually serving those citizens in in each of these countries. So they went through and uh, they they say based on their own criteria how they feel um, these countries are doing And I'll just point out some of the things that they found in general about the world. And they're now working on a more uh, global campaign that is going to come out of this report. But what they found, and this applied to almost every single country, that there's a lack of access to case decisions and statistics on whistleblower disclosures, which makes it hard to analyze how effective these laws are. 
the whistleblower laws are widely underutilized. Uh, on balance, many of the whistleblowers, according to this report, do not formally succeed in their retaliation complaints in nations where cases are arising with some frequency. Let's say they have 30 or more cases. It's slightly less than 13% of whistleblowers won formal final decisions. When excluding any dismissal, any dismissal for, you know, on a procedural ground or, um, and, and only considering decisions that were made on the merits, uh, whistleblowers won roughly 16% of the cases. That's really low. With all 37 countries combined, the overall success rate was 21%. So you see that in a lot of these countries that do have laws, it's highly difficult for the whistleblower to win. Even when whistleblowers officially prevail, according to the report, they often lose by winning because of small financial rewards, high costs, and lengthy, lengthy procedures for resolving these retaliation cases. More positively, the win-loss data understates the effectiveness of whistleblower laws because a significant portion of cases are relieved or, or resolved through settlements that would not occur in the absence of any kinds of laws that were protecting them. So, you know, very... Generally speaking, we can boil that down to whistleblowers just aren't winning uh, the vast majority of these cases. And they're actually um, only winning a very small percentage of these cases that they dare bring. And so uh, there's a lot of detail to this report. I, I, I plan to dig into this further and send something out with my dissenter newsletter that highlights some other aspects of it. But there is one thing that's really kind of shocking. Now, again, I already dealt with why they say the United States fits the criteria um, uh, that, that they they end up basically satisfying about 75 percent of what uh, they were looking for in countries. Uh, and that doesn't mean that the U.S. is a great place for whistleblowers, but it just means that we have paid lip service to whistleblower protection. Our politicians have paid lip service to protecting these whistleblowers and that those regulations and those laws are on the books. Now, uh, what I learned from this, what we learned from this report is that uh, Canada is in fact one of the worst countries when it comes to whistleblower protections. And that may astound some people, uh, but when they surveyed, they found that the, the rights um, that may look impressive on paper, only a mirage of protection in practice. Either they do not make a difference, or in some cases, they make whistleblowing more dangerous. And those whistleblower protections actually lag behind countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Botswana. And uh, so uh, they, they aren't ahead of some of the countries in which you would think they would have to be doing a better job than those countries just based on what we know about how those countries organize their own um, governments. So they point out that the government of Canada enacted something called the Public Servants Disclosure Protection Act. They found Government Accountability Project and this research unit found that eight whistleblower retali retaliation cases under this you know, framework. And in these eight cases, three complaints were from the same case and controversy. All three complainants settled. Only two of the eight cases received a decision on the merits. In both instances, the tribunal ruled against the whistleblower. In one of the decided cases before the tribunal, it took 580 days from the time the tribunal complaint was filed until the tribunal reached a decision. And when counting from the initial stage that there was a retaliation complaint to the final decision, there was a delay that lasted 2,398 days before this case was resolved. In other decided case, it took 833 days. Um, and uh, that was before a decision was rendered. And then uh, it was 200, it's 2,500 days overall, ultimately. So there's five cases that were settled in mediation and then the parties re withdrew. And there's also a, an instance of the tribunal suspending one case while pending a decision in federal court proceedings that were still ongoing. It's noteworthy that only eight whistleblowers re representing six controversies 
were allowed to bring a reprisal claims, reprisal is another word for retaliation, before this tribunal between 2005 and January 2020, when 358 complaints were submitted to the Integrity Commissioner's Office in that window. So that's, be clear here, eight whistleblowers allowed to go forward with their claims 358 complaints were submitted, eight out of 358 able to go forward and have their cases heard or litigated before this tribunal. And the Government Accountability Projects report goes on to say that this integrity commissioner must approve whistleblowers' requests to commence in tribunal proceedings. This minimal track record indicates that the commissioner is acting as a barrier to those seeking to enforce their legal rights. There's a 2017 report from Ryerson University, the Center for Free Expression, that looked at what was wrong with Canada's federal whistleblowing system, and it had an analysis of the systemic issues hampering the law. And it, uh, it, it showed that the law was nearly entirely dormant. That's the quote, nearly entirely dormant. Of the two cases ultimately determined on merits, a whistleblower was unsuccessful in both while each took an extended period of time. It takes tenacity and financial resources for any whistleblower to sustain a dispute involving retaliation for over six years only to lose. So you, you, know, you have someone fighting for six years to try and win this case and then coming up empty when it is all over. So you know, in... <laughs> I didn't know it was this bad uh, north of our border, but it looks like uh, if anything happens to you and you're a whistleblower in Canada, you really are SOL, as they say. And um, I, I'm not saying that this kind of thing doesn't happen in the United States, but it does seem like uh, there's actually even fewer cases moving forward in Canada than in the United States when it comes to these whistleblower cases and, you know, it's a, a smaller country and, uh, but still, I don't want to minimize it. Um, this looks pretty severe and I didn't know it was this bad in Canada when it came to whistleblower can, uh, protections. Thank you, Kevin. It's a super interesting report. Uh, we should link to it uh, after the show for people who want to check it out. Um, let's move on to our next story here. Uh, we have Congolese whistleblowers who allegedly expose an oligarch's efforts to evade U.S. sanctions reveal themselves. Uh, what is this story? Yeah, I sent out a report to everyone who's a subscriber of the Dissenter newsletter and, and covered what I think is a really important uh, case. Uh, a couple of really courageous whistleblowers from the Democratic Republic of the Congo they came forward. Their names are Navy Malela and Grady Coco, who uh, had to flee. They had to leave the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and they had uh, they're somewhere in Europe now and living in exile. They made disclosures for a report on money laundering uh, related to mining assets in the DRC. And they exposed a prominent and well-known Israeli oligarch, Dan Gertler, who, in the, who established a money laundering network for the purpose of evading U.S. sanctions that were imposed against him and to help him acquire new mining assets. Uh, these two whistleblowers were with the audit department of Afriland, First Bank, um, and uh, the platform to protect whistleblowers in Africa um, is uh, this this group that uh, has been supporting and and working to defend both of these whistleblowers. At the time that I put my story together, there were some troubling but unconfirmed reports suggesting that both of these whistleblowers had been convicted. Uh, it seemed pretty much in secrecy or in absentia and were facing a death sentence in the country um, for, you know, as, as retaliation for what they had done. Um, and it's, it's not clear that that's in fact true, but um, 
there was uh, there was talk by I believe this bank that that had in fact been done against these whistleblowers, um, and this is a this is a Cameroonian bank. Uh, Afrilon First Bank is a subsidiary in it's a Congolese subsidiary, and so this this bank ha- was uh, the subject of a report by this whistleblower supporting group uh, for, for African whistleblowers. And then uh, Global Witness was involved in doing a report in July of 2020 called Undermining Sanctions. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of detail that I provide that we can get into, but the thing that's really most noteworthy and what makes the pr- protecting these two whistleblowers even more crucial is that one of the last acts of the Trump administration was to remove these sanctions against Dan Gertler that were intended to guard against some of the exploitation that he'd been able to engage in this, this, you know, I'll, I'll call it 21st century colonialism that Dan Gertler is involved in. And he used his connections. Uh, it, there was a very, very good report done by the New York times that dug into the, uh, the, the, the bureaucratic, machinery and, and and what went on in order to get these sanctions un, unraveled and relaxed so that he basically has um, a, a full he was granted a full year until 2022 that he's a, he's not going to have to deal with these sanctions he was granted a special license uh, because treasury officials claim that there was some national security interest uh, that they had in allowing him to continue to conduct his dealings in Africa or to be free from sanctions. It was wildly absurd. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other prominent Israelis stepped in and backed this campaign to remove sanctions. Um, And uh, then uh, it was mentioned in the report from New York Times that Alan Dershowitz, this scum who uh, is known for uh, representing Trump against impeachment claims, also known for being a defender of Jeffrey Epstein and also being implicated in horrific sexual allegations that uh, he was involved in, in working to um, lobby the Trump administration to get these sanctions lifted against Dan Gertler. And what we're talking about here is a man who had the, who who developed a close friendship with the DRC president Joseph Kabila and was a middleman who was actually involved in mining asset sales um, and as a result this is what the treasury department said the reason why they imposed sanctions on him was because between 2010 and 2012 alone it is believed that the DRC lost over 1.36 billion dollars in revenues from the underpricing of mining assets that were sold to offshore companies linked to Gertler. Um, and that Dan Gertler is uh, involved in the conflict diamond or the blood diamond trade. He came to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to compete against De Beers, this notorious diamond business that has its roots in the apartheid and colonial past of South Africa. And you know, he used um, his connections to Kabila to be involved in cementing and negotiating a peace deal in 2003. But basically, he was doing this so that he could get more access for his empire of companies so that he could mine copper, um, have more uh, license and access to cobalt and gas and gold and other oil reserves so that he could be involved in uh, negotiating really good deals that then could be, and he was able to procure these assets for it's believed one sixth of their value. So all, all, so you know, really tremendous exploitation of the Congolese people. And so at its core, these disclosures by both of these whistleblowers, I think this is one of the more significant stories I could remember covering or or, or digging into in the last months, just because. It's it's such a, a tremendous issue, and uh, it's I think these are two people who find themselves at the center of um, of uh, 
of quite a lot of corruption uh, because, you know, not only are we talking about the evasion of U.S. sanctions that Dan Gertler is covering up, but you've got the support of the Israeli government who is involved in um, pushing for the end of sanctions within the Trump administration while at the same time um, getting out from under these sanctions or engaging in this money laundering, which they exposed, is for the purpose of furthering the colonial uh, exploitation of the Democratic Republic of the Congo at the great expense of the people because you know, the, the widespread reporting that we've seen on the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in addition to you know the, the violence, the war that has gone on in that, uh, in that area, in the region, that has impacted people greatly is that somewhere around 70 to 80 percent of the people live in extreme poverty. And, you know, while they, you know, might be working these mines and these jobs that amount to, 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 to near or, or tantamount to slavery, you know, the people of the, of the Democratic Republic of the Congo are not, re, they're not, they're not deriving the kind of uh, benefit from this wealth it's all going towards people like Dan Gertler. And that is why the Treasury Department singled him out because they recognized what he was doing was so gross in its impact and effect on the Congolese people. Thank you for that, Kevin. That was very thorough uh, and really important story to highlight. So appreciate that. Um, let's move over to Texas where the, oop, where oh, the, <laughs> That's all right. Where the attorney general uh, blocks testimony at a whistleblower hearing. What is the story here in Texas? And so a, a while back, we covered that there was this um, scandal that was brewing in Texas around Ken Paxton and allegations surrounding him. Um, uh, just you know, things like cronyism and. Um, to, to the extent to, to which you know he was involved in um, covering up fraudulent conduct, uh, there were people within his attorney general's office that left. Uh, I think it was like a half dozen or so people who um, faced retaliation or ended up being fired. They were forced out of his office, and there's this. Uh, there's a there's a few outlets that covered this, mostly local to Texas. I just wanted to do a bit of a follow-up and mention that we're now having hearings where people are questioning. And uh, what you now see is that this uh, Texas Attorney General, uh, who I think we mentioned um, a, a little while back, uh, maybe a week or two ago, um, all of the attention was given to Ted Cruz, but Ken Paxton was also notable because during the crisis in Texas, he did flee and go to Utah in order to escape the freeze that was um, on ongoing in the, his state uh, because of the deregulation of the energy grid that, in fact, um, you know, he legally was involved in supporting through his office. I'd imagine that was something that um, he was involved in, in giving legal cover to anything that those energy companies were able to do. So Ken Paxton um, is uh, facing these whistleblower allegations and they're holding hearings now, but he apparently had his attorneys step in, the people who are representing his office, representing him, trying to protect him from these corrupt allegations that uh, are the allegations of corruptions, stepped in to block the vast majority of questions um, that uh, were, were, were brought um, during this hearing, and he is uh, basically disrupting the ability of um, this these people to further pursue these allegations. He's frustrating it. Um, the attorneys for uh, the people who are complaining against Ken Paxton say that he's desperate to stop the truth from coming out, and uh, but then they turn it around and say, sadly, the price for Ken Paxton's delays and hiding and obstruction will be borne by the taxpayers and by the brave public servants who stood up to Paxton's corruption and deserve their day in court. Yeah, because it's just going to prolong these proceedings because eventually, you know, this this is all going to have, uh, I mean, all of these people are going to eventually get their opportunity. He's just delaying and delaying and making it harder for them to bring their cases. So, uh, 
uh, and he got the backing, it looks like, of an appeals court who agreed to grant um, uh, um, uh, gr grant a kind of injunction or something so that he actually was supported and not uh, and didn't have to face some of the questions. So uh, we'll keep following this. I just wanted to, for the most part, it's a very small aspect of the story that I wanted to focus in on, which is that you have this moment where Ken Paxton is making it almost nearly impossible for these whistleblowers to pursue these cases in these hearings. They're having open hearings and it's supposed to be for um, dealing with this case, but making it impossible for it to go forward. Thank you. Um, let's go to our last story here. We have a whistleblower who says that the National Guard members at Capitol Hill are getting sick from the food. Tell us about this one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say, obviously, I don't think that these National Guards people should actually, actually be deployed to the Capitol Hill any longer. I don't know what their purpose is. Uh, they're fortifying the Capitol, uh, but it's not wartime. And I don't, I don't actually think they need to be there any longer, but they're there. And we've seen some stories about how poorly they're being cared for. Um, many of these working class men and women who are part of the National Guard. This story relates specifically to um, Michigan National Guardsmen. There was a staff sergeant with the Mich Michigan National Guard who said that nearly 75 meals were thrown out uh, this past Sunday after metal shavings were found. And there are other, sh other meals that have shown up that are undercooked cooked, and they're making soldiers sick. So you got local news media in the state of Michigan reporting this. Uh, and they say that, um, that they're actually having uh, issues with quantity, not enough food to feed people. Um, and sometimes um, they, you'll get a Danish, some juice. Sometimes um, it, it may be something different. And uh, that this undercooked food, it, it's um, uh, something that has been raised with the chain of command. And there's been issues with the consistency of the kind of food that is, is brought to you. Uh, it's undercooked. It's brought to the people in the National Guard. Um, and it just it doesn't look like it's anything that sh that that would be safe for consumption. In some cases, uh, you know, this is raw meat that we're talking about that is being given to people. And an anonymous sergeant apparently told one local news outlet that they are not supposed to eat the meals that were going to be brought for the next two days, and then they're eating MREs instead, which you know, is essentially what they would be giving out if they were in a war zone and they needed to give food aid to refugees or people who were impacted. So they're giving out these like meal kits to national guardsmen who are deployed to Capitol Hill, which is insane. And so the fact that this continues, um, I think it should raise the issue of why these people are still there if they can't be taken care of, but it does really boggle the mind why they can't get decent food to people who are there. Um, and I'm not going to make appeals to patriotism or anyone's nationalism, but just in a very basic sense, if you're deployed there to protect politicians at Capitol Hill, and again, I question what they're protecting at this point, as far as like what the threat may or may not be, it certainly doesn't seem immediate, but if they're going to be there, why can't you feed them actual food that is cooked better um, and the, the lack of resources and investment, it, it, it really just, uh, I think it exposes something that a lot of people know about how disposable uh, soldiers and, and some of these forces tend to be when they're asked to do jobs and they're not taken care of at all and their health is not looked after and they're not given decent food when they're deployed. But, um, I mean, we've known this about our country um, whether it's in peacetime or wartime, the lack of disinvestment uh, for people who are asked to um, put on fatigues and, and, and deploy for war and how they often are doing so, but do not get the same kind of investment that you'd expect 
from a country that you know trots them out and and has everybody put bumper stickers on their cars and we're all wearing wit ribbons but that doesn't necessarily match the kind of money that goes into making sure that they stay healthy and and aren't treated like they're disposable people thank you kevin uh indeed very strange i mean they're in the capital they're in the middle of a city it's not like they're out <laughs> in the countryside or something, <laughs> you know, I wonder which crony got the, uh, the food contract. I mean, I why would a I'll meal, I mean, shit. it almost sounds like they're, they're, they're prisoners. They're getting a, a sunny D and a dinner roll. And that's a meal. Like, yeah, I don't know. it's almost like not, not that, you know, one's better than the other. I don't, I don't mean to make that comparison for that purpose, but it's just kind of like what, um, you know, what, when you're being given kits that are for refugees, it's just like uh, yeah, there's so something fair. going on. Uh, so do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the newsletter, what you've been working on, what you have coming up, uh, a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I'm just and I'm just taking one moment to check in with everyone over here in the chat. Um, since uh, we moved through the show pretty quickly and I'm just making sure that... Uh, there's nothing here as far as like a question or anything from anyone yeah. that they might like me to respond to. Uh, do I, I have a, there's a good question here. Do I see a rise in corporate control and whistleblower suppression? I mean, abs absolutely. Um, and I'd say that like both are connected. I mean, it seems pretty reasonable to say that the more we have corporations that are influencing our government, the more likely we are to see whistleblowers suppressed and actually it becomes harder. I mean, that, that to me is more concerning than just having retaliation from the government, because I understand where to push in order to get some kind of um, um, re to pursue for recourse, to, to, to win damages. I know, I know where to go. I, I, I know where people go. Like a lot of the cases that I deal with involve people who had government positions. Um, and so, um, you know, you can, you can blame agencies that are funded by taxpayer dollars, but when it just has to do with what private corporations are involved with, then they can be opaque. You know, like we, we run a system that allows them to have, all of these contracts with government agencies, but then obscure those actions and keep what they're doing secret from us and protect it. And we'll have government agencies actually defend those records as proprietary and say that we can't know what they're doing because if they told us, then they might be betraying the, the, the interests of their client or they might be jeopardizing that contract so they can get away with a whole lot and their secrecy. And then that can fuel, I think, the suppression. I mean, why is it hard to get contractors to be included and supported in these whistleblower protection laws? I think it's because of the influence of corporations over our government. I absolutely think that that is a case. Uh, now, I don't really have an update this week on uh, Julian Assange, but I saw that mess it, that mentioned. I mean, I'll remind everyone that we're still following it. We're, we're, we're looking to see what is going to be the next step here for uh, Joe Biden's administration. We're looking to see what the attorney general, once he's confirmed, I expect Merrick Garland to be confirmed. We're looking to see what kind of a policy paper they might put forward to justify how they handle these kinds of a cases, uh, these kinds of cases. Um, Greg has a question here. Do you think fear is what keeps people from being whistleblowers? Uh, and I think, yes, that a lot of people won't come forward. I also think that if you look at the cobweb of laws and regulations and you're not sure how to navigate them, that can lead to your fear. So there's a fear of retaliation. Um, there's a fear that you're going to be found out and then people who you work with are not going to like you. Um, this is obviously something that we see in police departments, but it exists in government agencies. It exists in national security agencies, at national security contractors. And if they find out who you are, you might not be able to ha hold your position anymore. You may not be able to move up in the ranks. It impacts your career. 
your supervisor might find out that you blew the whistle on them and then you could be in trouble. But I think it goes beyond just fear of what could happen to you individually, but also a fear that you might not actually do this correctly because we set up our laws and these regulations in ways that are sometimes very difficult to follow. And this is, relates to a story we covered the past week about how the Justice Department isn't notifying people who are contractors that they do have whistleblower rights and protections. And because this is the system in which we find ourselves, um, and I think it, this is something that people struggle with. And it's also why we should be very lenient and, and not fall prey to the kind of conversation we see when people do leak because a lot of times, especially if they're lower level and they don't have high ranking positions when they can get away with it, those lower level people are probably doing it because they find it to be very simple and easy. You know what Reality Winner did to provide a document to The Intercept, ignoring all the things that went wrong um, with The Intercept. What she did, it seems very simple and easy just to get out the information that you want. When you're looking at the regulations and the laws that are supposed to protect you, it could take months, if not years, for you to get anything out of bringing that document to a Senate committee or to bring it to your supervisor. You're not necessarily going to be able to share it with the public, which is what you want. You want that information to be public. That's why you're taking the risk. Um, you want somebody to act on it. You want um, your agency to make some kind of disclosure so people know the truth of what's going on internally. And when you know that that's not going to happen, I think there's a simplicity to just going to the media. Uh, you know, obviously I'm biased. I favor that because we get a lot of good news stories. Um, the the media industry, but uh, in, in general, gets a lot of news stories from whistleblowers who are sources. I mean, these are sources. The people who are leaking are engaged in taking a risk to become sources for reporters and journalists. And this is good. And this is how we fuel vibrant investigative journalism. But, um, you know, the reason why they would do it this way and not follow the kinds of whistleblower protections or laws that are available to them is because they could be confusing and they don't know what kind of benefit they're going to get if they follow. And so they'll just, you know, take on that risk of going to the media, seeing if for some way or another they can stay anonymous, which is obviously difficult in this age when your keystrokes are tracked, uh, people can know uh, what printers you use, if you used a fax machine, how did you get the material, uh, they know when you went through in and out of a security checkpoint, they can track your movements. Some of these people are under total surveillance if they are at the Pentagon or some of these other agencies are actually keeping track of your online behavior beyond when you're just in the office. And so that can add to the fear. Uh, these people know that they're being watched and uh, they know that what they do decide to do, it, it could be the end of their career. So that certainly contributes to these decisions and, and whether or not to make them. Um, so let's see, as, as we wrap up here, um, and, and we will wrap, um, thank you everyone for following this show. Uh, this is the link for the newsletter, dissenter.substack.com. Uh, let's go ahead and bring Brian, come back to the conversation as we, as we wrap up. Oh, talk about Sorry. The the, the dog the, was chewing the bone very loudly in the background, so I was hiding. Uh, she's, uh, <laughs> well, you know, at some point, at some point, you'll have to. She should make a cameo. In yeah, I'll try to lure her she's, over here. Yeah, well, when she's chewing your leg, maybe we should just uh, yeah sit back and watch the entertainment. At, Breaking if, if if you'll let us have that at your expense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, um. This story that this report you did for the Marvel, uh, well, it wasn't for the, we, so we, we've got the Marvel Cook Fellowship going on, um, and we want to mention that again, but um, the story we just worked on, on the media industry and the uh, unionizing that is going on nationwide, um, I just wanted to call attention to it, which you did some really good work making that possible. Um, it, it's, this was Thank done, you. this was done by... Um, Billy Anania yes. is the name of the writer. Billy Anania. This was the and this was the first time published. First time published at Shadowproof with That's Billy, right. and uh, 
this digs into what's going on in newsrooms across the United States, um, the the assaults that the people in, and these are local newspapers. Um, I want to stress that like, I feel there's a difference here. This isn't like the Washington Post. This isn't like the New York Times. These aren't CNN. These are um, many of these people are, are, are good reporters who are fighting for their survival. Um, they are people at newspapers like the Texas Tribune and the Fort Worth Star-Telegram in Texas who provided indispensable coverage of the crisis during the freeze in Texas when everyone lost power. Um, mm -hmm. and, and these are these are newspapers that we don't want to lose because this is our window into what's going on in these communities. If we lose them, then we start to not have any idea what's happening regionally in this country. So yeah. you have people who are struggling against the, uh, the, the hedge fund vampires, people fighting the pandemic. Yeah. I think this was such an important, comprehensive, wide ranging report for us to get published so people could see some of what's gone on in the last year. I know we've lost like 30 to 45,000 journalist jobs or media jobs since the pandemic started. It's been a hemorrhage of, yeah. uh, of, of, of people from this industry. And I understand that there's a lot of animosity out there that people think that, you know, not us, but others in our industry are the bad guys and they're not doing a good enough job to report on stories that matter and you're all not getting the truth. And so why should we save them? Why should we save these newspapers? There's a lot of questions about, you know, why should we care about them when, you know, they publish fake news or they just want to mm. hype stories around Russia or they want to lie us into war or they want to do this and that and and not really help working people or maybe spit in the face of workers' struggles or maybe not care about prisoner strikes that are ongoing. Be that as it may, I think that these organizations are important for us to save and they are seeing that they should act like other labor unions and they should mobilize and they should protect their interests and they should stand up to these vultures that are coming into their offices and trying to take over and steer them in directions that are like what we see with Sinclair, where they want you to basically serve the oligarchs in the more major cities of the United States, serve their agendas. Um, and uh, we, I think it's really important for us to save these organizations from being completely dismantled and destroyed. Yeah, I really liked this piece. Um, you should definitely check it out at Shadowproof. The headline is uh, U.S. Journalists Form Unions to Survive Hedge, hedge Fund Vampires and COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, Billy did a really good job of putting it in the context of the sort of wider erosion of local news over the years. And and I mean, I think another uh, way to think about this too, Kevin, in addition to some of the points that you made is that, you know, even just today, I was talking to a freelancer uh, who's pitching a story to us actually for the Marvel uh, Cook Fellowship, who is telling me um, that they graduated uh, from school, they were studying journalism, and they graduated in May of last year, uh, as the pandemic was kicking off. Um, and so I think it's important to think about also not just what's happening to journalists right now and what has been happening to journalists, but sort of creating better conditions for journalists who are coming up, uh, whose work, especially on the local level, is probably going to be so consequential in the coming decade um, as climate change heats up, migrations heat up, uh, we continue to sort of spiral out of control in this neoliberal fantasy uh, that we are strapped inside of. Um, and so I, I just sort of want to add that uh, to, to people's radars when they're thinking about supporting local news and, and about the plight facing journalists. And if you give uh, to an organization like Shadowproof so we can then hire, you know, honestly, a lot of these workers who've been, uh, who are looking for work uh, in the midst of the pandemic right now who have lost their, their gigs, even freelancers who had regular, you know, writing gigs with other outlets and who now have seen those budgets for freelancing slashed. Uh, you know, we're not even necessarily talking about people who are staff. Uh, you know, obviously, if we're talking about the union, we are. But if we're talking more largely about the conditions facing workers, 
in this industry, I think we need to bring the freelancers into that. And so, yeah, I just, I just wanted to point out sort of the, the generations ahead uh, and planning for a, a news industry for them because we're going to need it. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot we need to do about thinking about how we can save journalism and save, save the news industry. Um, there's been some thinking, uh, you know, my first, uh, my first introduction to thinking about this differently was reading um, this book that John Nichols and Robert McChesney had done, um, suggesting that, you know, maybe, you know, some other countries do offer vouchers to people so that they can, you know, they, they get basically a kind of credit that then they can pass on that money right. to uh, help do public funding of these um, media organizations. You get to choose where to direct that money and, and what kind of media you want to support. So no, you wouldn't have to fund CNN or New York Times or MSNBC if you didn't want to. Uh, obviously, they don't need money. They have corporations. You would want to give it to the newspapers that um, you know have truly benefited. Um, and this book was really good about showing how the rise of newspapers was completely intertwined with the postal service and 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 sort of like the history of the printing press in mm -hmm. the United States and 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 why we needed to defend this journalism. I just would say finally that and why I think it's good for us to spend time on this as we wrap this, even though it's different from talking about whistleblowers, is that there are a lot of uh, these stories that are local that we'll talk about on this show that I'm certain I would not know about and I would not get to cover in the Dissenter Weekly uh, if we didn't have these local newspapers because they just mm -hmm. wouldn't get reported from uh, by these organizations that are more nationally focused in what they do. There may be, you know, a progressive media outlet here and there who hears some murmurs and rumblings you know, occasionally the Intercept or let's say the American Prospect or maybe even the Daily Poster might come across this stuff. But I remind you that last week we talked about the software bug and that was coming from um, a, a local outlet um, and also was covered in local press out in Arizona. Um, and, you know, the people who have done the best work covering the prison in which Reality Winner is incarcerated, Carswell, this federal medical center, even though it is a federal facility. And so you could argue that there is a reason why national news media should be covering what's going on in that facility, more so than just state newspapers or local newspapers, because it does actually tie back to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, a national, um, you know, a national agency, a federal government agency. Be that as it may, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram has done the best work tracking what has gone on with the outbreaks, the the uh, there you know that time when there were over 500 people at Carswell that had the COVID-19 virus, and uh, they've tracked what was going on with people in and around Reality Winter, what the women in this facility have been going through. Um, they've covered other prisons, other federal prisons in the area and the effect of COVID-19. They covered the impact of the freeze in Texas. And so this is really, I believe, um, in reasons why you know, we really need to stand up for these people. You know, obviously, we think that unions are worth fighting for. We promote labor solidarity. Any of these newsrooms that want to form these unions are going to be worthy of, of, of supporting. But what makes it even more than just like, oh, you have a union, let's support you, is that a lot of them are going to uh, be protected in their pursuit, the further pursuit of these stories. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of um, the pushback that came from, um, um, uh, I think it was um, money and, and corporate interests in Las Vegas when one of the reporters wanted to do the investigation into Sheldon Adelson and his casino empire and, and do those. And, um, you know, the way in which they were able to silence people and intimidate and push people out of media organizations because they didn't have union protections or labor uh, or, or the protection of being part of a labor union. And so, uh, and, and we read about the, the conflict that was going on there in Vegas. And, you know, that's possible because of uh, the, the decline of the media industry. And so hopefully 
this nas national trend of uh, th this national trend of unionizing is going to give security to some of these journalists to do some of this more important investigative journalism work to continue to take these risks. And then we're going to see some of these newspapers um, become more indispensable in their communities that people are going to be able to save them. And, you know, I have a free weekly here in Chicago called the Chicago reader that does some incredible work. Um, it's an independent paper, uh, but you know, it's my way of knowing what's going on in my local community. And they put out some of the best stories about the corruption within the Chicago police department. They do some of the best detailing of what's going on with uh, corruption at City Hall, the sh Chicago mayor's office. Um, and so knowing that that paper is out there, it's, it's, it's something that I want to keep going. So I just, I don't know if anybody here is from any particular parts of the United States. Uh, if you're outside of the United States, I just encourage you to, um, if you can, uh, make sure you're doing your part to try to keep these institutions going. I think it's really important to have local news media more so than any kind of national news outlet. Yeah, I agree. And if I would add to that too, not just local media, and, and again, like I'm not just saying this about shadow proof, it could be any small uh, independent outlet, but beat reporters. I mean, another yes. thing that uh, is just falling by the wayside, I feel like uh, that we need more of are people who are invested in the stories that they're telling and are not just kind of moonlighting uh, on certain topics or, you know, sort of this jack of all trades reporter that has come up in the last decade or two. Um, you know, we need people who are like really invested in the stories they're telling and the communities that they're telling the stories from. So um, completely agree with that. Um, right. Well, with that, I think we could wrap. Yeah. So thanks everybody for watching. Uh, make sure that you're following wherever you're watching. Uh, we do this show every Thursday at four o'clock. Subscribe to Kevin's awesome newsletter right there, dissenter.substack.com. Um, and check out shadowproof.com for the wonderful reporting we're doing. Check out the Marvel Cook uh, Fellowship that we've got going on and um, been working really hard on a bunch of stories there too that we will share with you soon. Um, but thanks for joining us and we will see you next week. Take care. <laughs>